When you think of the great desert cities of the world, Cairo, Marrakesh, Baghdad, and maybe even Phoenix come to mind. These are cities of legend that have been the hub of great trade routes or are commercial capitals for their region. Each has had its day in the sun, so to speak, where it exerted power well beyond its borders and even beyond the desert where it held its sway. Rarely, though, does anyone think of India's great Thar Desert and its majestic ruling monarch Jodhpur. So join us today as we explore Jodhpur, India's Queen of the Desert. Namaste, I'm Bill Ball, and I'm going to be your guide on this episode of Journeys in India. And this is India. Today I'm going to be visiting a city that's known by many names. If you look at the map, it's Jodhpur. If you ask the locals, it's Sun City, and you can see why. And if you go up on the hill where the fort is and you look down, you can see how it got its other name, the Blue City. But whatever name you use, it's still one of the most fascinating cities in Rajasthan. Rajasthan is located on the northwest shoulder of India. When one thinks of Rajasthan, the pink city of Jaipur and the romantic haven of Udaipur come to mind. Well, that's so 2013. The heart of Rajasthan is the Thar Desert, and the queen of the Thar Desert is Jodhpur. Just 208 miles from Jaipur, it has direct flights from Delhi, Jaipur, and Udaipur. I'm standing here in front of one of the ancient gates of Jodhpur, where you might think would be a great place to start telling the history of this magnificent city. But you'd be wrong. Actually, the best place isn't even in the city, but six miles north in a place called Mandor. Mandor hardly looks like a place that a great city would owe its roots to. It is a deserted, small village that history and time hides its true significance. It was here that the early Marwar rulers built their capital and their sentef. Sentefs are monuments left for maharajas or kings in lieu of a burial site. The Marwar rulers were Hindus, and as good Hindus, their bodies were not buried, but cremated, and their ashes released into a river. The Sentefs marked the spot where the funeral pyres were located and serve as a lasting monument to that leader. Today, this once sacred ground is open to tourism. The city's history traces back over 800 years to the early Pandar dynasty. This ancient dynasty ruled from Mandar even after merging by marriage to the rapidly ascending Rajputs at the end of the 14th century. The Rajputs continued to use Mandor as their capital until 1459 when Jodhpur became the region's headquarters. Mandor was still the final resting place for the Maharajas for the next 400 years. It was only then that Jodhpur came into its own. Jodhpur lies at the edge of the Thar Desert and is unmistakable as the great medieval fort Mehravgarh dominates the view. This ancient Marwar capital was known as the land of death for its arid conditions. Founded in 1459 by Rao Jadhar, who found a way to take advantage of the massive 400 foot high cliffs to build the extraordinary and virtually impregnable fort that is still the city symbol and main attraction. The walls are six miles long, broken by eight monumental gates. It is truly a showstopper. Rudyard Kipling called the fort a creation of angels, fairies, and giants. The walls were so strong and the battlements so secure that the mighty Mughals, who captured all the lands around Jodhpur, could not take the city. The Mughals instead married their way into the fortified town. A deal was struck in the mid-16th century with the ruler of Jodhpur. He consented to marry off his sister to Mughal Emperor Akbar and his daughter to Akbar's son. There is a moral here. As part of the deal, Akbar made him give up beef, garlic, onions, and worst of all, his beard. So beware of the deals you cut, because you may end up losing face, so hair.
Unfortunately, relations between the Mughals and Jodhpur's rulers soured fast when Jodhpur backed the wrong side on a Mughal power play. Jodhpur has supported the ruler Shah Johan, the builder of the Taj Mahal, over his power-hungry son Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb wins and imprisons his father in the Agra fort for the rest of his life. His revenge on Jodhpur was to be even more severe. He ordered the young heir to the Jodhpur throne murdered. In Delhi at the time, the boy was whisked away by supporters in a basket of sweetmeats. Thirty years later, the boy prince recaptures his Jodhpur kingdom, making him the city's greatest hero. Today, the Jodhpur fort that influenced and molded the city we see today is open to the public as a museum. The wall statistics are impressive. At some places, the walls are 79 feet thick and 131 feet high. The royal apartments, once reserved for the ruler and his family, are open and part of the museum. This entrance ticket is one of the best buys anywhere. It covers all of the walls, fortifications, royal apartments, and the royal collections. For a small additional price, you can take the elevator to the top of the fort, so you only need to walk downhill. This is a great investment, as the climb is steep. Before 1995, when the elevator was added, it was all foot power. Remember, though the fort was first and foremost a defensive structure, through the years it has seen its share of action, mostly from Mughals. Everything was geared for survival in the case of an attack. For instance, a massive water wheel was installed to manually bring water to the top of the fort. Lucky for us, the builders of this monstrous fort made it so strong that it still stands today. The day-to-day -day court life was not focused on the military aspects of the fort, though. The rulers of Jodhpur liked all things beautiful, and the palace decor reflects their fascination with art and exquisite craftsmanship. The windows and screens were handcrafted by the finest stone carvers. Music filled the palace, entertaining both the Maharaja and his female consorts. The Palace Museum includes many of the art and furniture collections accumulated over the years. One piece of furniture the Jodhpur Mawars prized above all else was their thrones. This one was a gift from Shah Johan. Remember, the Maharajas of Jodhpur backed Johan over his ambitious son in a bloody civil war. Maybe this magnificent throne helped sway them. The art of this region is unique. The paintings are known as Marwars, after the ruling family and the region. One special characteristic of this style of painting is that the people are never shown head on, only in profile. Even the animals are in profile. This is an incredible complex. Each new room or building displays another collection, creating a window to the past. There are collections of palaquins, a human-carried regal transport method for the ruler and his family, arms and armaments, and even baby cradles, one for each of the Maharajas. All times, though, were not happy at the palace. Tragedy struck more than once. An unfinished room is a shrine to an artist that died working on it. The Maharaja loved the artist's work so much, he never let anyone else finish it. Here a poisoned robe that was used to kill the king. And a photo of the Maharaja was placed on this cradle of his infant son when he was killed in a plane crash. But probably the most tragic of all was the act of Saadi, symbolized by these handprints. Saadi is where the wives and concubines would throw themselves on the funeral pyre of the deceased ruler. His prestige was measured by the number of women killing themselves. The most ever was the eight queens and 58 concubines of Ajit Singh in 1731. The practice has thankfully been banned. Some people might balk at calling a building a piece of art, but there is no denying the artisanship that went into this masterpiece of stonework. 
The Jajwat Fada is passed on the way down from the fort to the city proper. This dazzling white marble memorial is dedicated to Jajwat Singh, one of the most famous and beloved Maharajas of Jodhpur. He was a wise and kind ruler that dedicated much of his time and money to irrigating this arid land, bringing prosperity to his people. He ruled in the late 19th century and his legend grew so mythic that many believed he had a healing touch. People still visit this memorial to seek his help. He was the first ruler to locate his Sentef in Jodhpur rather than with his ancestors in Mandapur. Subsequent rulers have followed his example. This memorial recalls all of the ancestors with their portraits lining the walls. The closer you look at the craftsmanship, the more you will appreciate the intricate carvings of the fine latrice work and elegant pillars. This is one of the must-see sites not only in Jodhpur or Rajasthan, but in all of India. Jodhpur is called the Blue City, much like Jaipur is the Pink City and Udaipur is the White City. The name is not without cause. Much of the old town is indeed blue in color. From the parapets of the fort, the color of the buildings is easily discernible. This, the second largest city in Rajasthan, is probably painted blue because of the then priestly caste called Brahmins who painted their houses blue to distinguish themselves. Some brave non-Brahmin broke tradition and followed suit, and the rest is history. Locals claim that it keeps the houses cooler and repels insects, but that seems unlikely. If it worked, every building in Rajasthan would be blue. Jodhpur made its fortune as a trading post and refueling stop along the main camel caravan route. The Maiwars were an enterprising merchant class that even today run many of the businesses in India. That tradition of trade, especially in the spices that created the caravans of yesteryear, is not only alive in Jodhpur, but flourishing. The main market in town is the Sardar Bazaar, or the Old Market. The streets are off limits to cars, but not to cows, tuk-tuks, and the swarms of would-be bargain hunters. You can just about find anything here, from bangles to a haircut. Some of the best and freshest vegetables are available every day, straight from the farmer. The market is entered through the Gurdkat gate, and you can move from section to section, but you can't help but notice that the market is not so much anarchy as planned chaos. The centerpiece of the market is a clock tower built in 1912. This is the classic meeting point for anyone that gets lost or separated from their family and friends. But the real heart of the market goes back to the roots of Jodhpur and the early camel caravans, spices. Here you can find just about every spice imaginable. Coriander, nutmeg, curry, the list goes on. Comparison shopping is really easy since all the spice shops are in a row on one street. This spice shop's claim to fame was being visited by the cast of the movie Darjeeling Express, starring Owen Wilson. Hmm, I wonder if they'll tell future visitors that I was here. Every city has their craft, and for some, it's carvings or paintings, while others specialize in pottery. In a nearby specialty market, we learn that in Jodhpur, it's tie-dye. The first step in tie-dyeing is to select a pattern. The more intricate, the better. Some of the selected patterns may not even seem realistic to the amateur pot-in-the-sink tie-dyer, but these are artisans and they have perfected the art to a T, a T as in tie-dye. Once the pattern is set in the master dyer's mind, he or she begins to tie off the areas that are not to be dyed with wax string. This is a family business and each brother, sister, cousin has a specific role. While one is tying the strings, the other is dipping the already tied off cloth in the next color. A few carefully selected ties are then removed and it is dipped into another color until the finished product is unveiled. This is the life's work and the dyers have permanently colored hands to prove their craft. The final masterpieces are gorgeous. These scarfs will be sold throughout India, with some even being found in overseas markets where the buyers 
have discovered the quality and craftsmanship of Jodhpur tie dyes. For the best values, look where the final step, drying, is being done. As the scarves dry for the last time, special detailing is added to the custom-made garments. Textiles bought directly from the artisans are even cheaper than in the shops, and you can literally order the color and pattern you want on your shirt or scarf and watch it being made. I've got a unique opportunity to visit a very special people, the Bishnoi people. They're the original conservation people in all of India. For hundreds of years, they preserved and protected the wildlife of this area. And now, as they move from a traditional lifestyle to a more modern one, they're continuing in that very same role. So who are the Bisnoi? Why are they considered India's original conservationists? Tackling the first part of that question is a bit trickier than it would initially appear. The Bisnoi are unique people with a special take on life. They are followers of the 15th century sage, John Beshwar, whose core creed has 29 distinct principles. Bis means 20 and Noi is nine. So the Bisnoi people are the people of the 29 principles. One of the foremost ideals that many of the 29 principles focus on is environmental protection. The Bishnoi faith commands them to protect every living being, even with their own lives. The result is, for instance, that the Indian gazelle, a very timid and flighty animal in most of the Indian continent, including in protected national parks, walks casually and without fear in and around the Bishnoi villages. Even the largest of the Indian antelope species, the blue bull, finds protection here. This wildlife guardianship is not without reason. The Bisnoi people believe they will be reincarnated as a deer. The Bisnoi are easily distinguished by their clothing. The women wear a veil like a head covering and vivid textiles accented by silver jewelry, while most of the men wear only white baggy clothes and turbans. They adopt a simple life, foregoing many of the modern conveniences so they can remain in the desert, which has always been their home. As part of a Hindu sect, they revere the cow and do not eat beef. Mostly farmers, they practice a store for the future and share with your neighbor philosophy that many more modern cultures have long abandoned. The women are skilled in textiles and cloth making and have turned their home skills into money to buy the few goods they can't make themselves. Bisnoi cloth is highly sought after in India. Times are changing and the Bisnoi are beginning to embrace these changes. But no matter how their personal lifestyle evolves, the core principles of conservation will persist. It is the way of the Bisnoi. Jodhpur not only offers interesting and one-of-a-kind sites and unique cultural opportunities to visit little-known cultures, but it also extends a special field of lodging opportunities. Jodhpur offers two very different hotel stays that local royalty still live in. One for the traveler with a large budget and one for those of us that don't have unlimited resources. We'll start with the more budget conscious choice. Just because you choose to stay at the less pricey heritage hotel doesn't mean the famous haven't stayed here. When Prince Charles and Camilla visited Jodhpur, they stayed here. For the Anglophile, here is a chance to sleep where the prince and future king slept. Heritage hotels are a loose affiliation of privately owned palaces still maintained and lived in by the Maharaja and his family. The public areas tend to be magnificent, while the bedrooms, though complete with all the amenities a Western tourist wants, are basic. They do come, though, with stories of war, power, love, and occasionally ghosts. I'm not a superstitious kind of person, but there is one room at the very top of the palace, the one Prince Charles stayed in, that is a bit spooky, to say the least. During our stay, unexplained sounds, rattling doors, and rolling noises were heard all night. I didn't see anything, but it was weird. 
Think what you want, an old building settling or the ghost of a Maharaja of the past? The other hotel in Jodhpur that allows you to live with royalty is the home of the current Maharaja and the second biggest private residence in the world. Only Buckingham Palace is larger, and you can't stay there. The hotel and palace is called Umad Buwan. This unbelievable cream-colored sandstone and marble wonder is a luxury hotel run by the Taj Group. To give you a scale of its size, there are 347 rooms, eight dining halls, two theaters, a ballroom, and a 197-foot dome that covers a cavernous central hall that sat 1,000 guests for dinner when the palace had its inauguration. This incredible masterpiece of architecture is a fusion of Rajput, Jain, and Art Deco styles. The British architect, Sir Henry Vaughan Lancaster, already famous for creating the Central Hall of Westminster in London, created this seamless combination of Indian and Western styles. Begun in 1929 as a make-work project initiated by Maharaja Umad Singh, it is a mammoth undertaking unrivaled in India at the time. Jodhpur was in the midst of a famine and this construction project employed 3,000 men for 15 years. Additional workers were needed to lay 12 miles of railroad track to bring the sandstone from the quarry. Those aren't even the most impressive statistics. The hotel sits on 26 acres, nine of which are the palace. It took a half a million donkey loads of earth for the garden beds, 100 wagon loads of marble, and one million yards of steel conduit. Now, we come to the best part, the interior. Massive brass doors invite visitors into an Art Deco lobby and the unbelievably large, soaring inner courtyard topped by the spectacular dome. Opulence would be an understatement, from the furnishings to the smallest sculptural detail, from the award-winning Rishala restaurant, known for its fine Rajasthani dishes and continental specialties, to the traditional gentleman's wing, complete with billiards room. No detail is overlooked. Every room in the palace is different, though they are all decorated with original furnishings. But the creme de la creme are the grand suites that once were the private domain of the Maharaja and his wife. We got a rare glimpse at what it would be like to stay in these $10,000 plus a night suites that hosted the likes of Bill Gates and Madonna. These multi-room extravaganzas have their own private spa, living and dining rooms. Even if staying at the palace is out of your budget, you can get a taste, literally, by having lunch in the restaurant and visiting the museum. In our Jaipur show last season, we had Chef Mellar define what a tali platter was. Now, we can show you how one is created. Tali is a way of presenting food, a personal buffet of regional dishes, so its contents differ from one region to another. The most famous is the Rajasthani tali, so that is what we asked Chef to make. Our first tali dish is the mukha sola, a chicken dish. Boneless chicken breast is cut into pieces and rolled in a ginger garlic paste, and then fresh lemon juice is added. It is left overnight to marinate. Spices are added, including onion paste, chili paste, yogurt, cinnamon, and cardamom. Marinate for another half hour and grill for eight to 10 minutes. While one dish is being prepared, the chef begins another. This time it's lal mas a mutton or lamb dish that is quite tasty, mainly because of the liberal use of chili paste and brown onions. Then, several other dishes are added to create the final delectable tray. Next time you eat in an Indian restaurant, whether at home or in India, and are not sure what to order, try the tali platter. You get to try several dishes without having to commit to one. From the city of many names, Jodhpur, we learned what it was like to be a Maharaja. First, we started the early years in Mandor, then we went to the magnificent fort, and now we learn what it's like to be one now here at this wonderful palace. Let's take a look at some of the highlights.
I'm Bill Ball, and I'll see you on the next episode of Journeys in India.